in terms of your going into service, there was no draft for women, so you must have enlisted. Oh yeah, you volunteered, but there weren't any jobs. Ah, so in, that... In, into World War II, they quit making tanks and uniforms and boots, and consequently, it, it, might, it might as well have been 1932. There weren't any, I was working at a bakery for 22 cents an hour. I used to ask Mrs. Jacobs, why 22? You know, try 25. So. <laughs> I agree. So what year did you enlist? Let's see. I got out of high school in 48, and I went over to John B. Stetson, so uh, 51, 1951. And... Um, how many women did not usually enlist? There, there was a small group. Oh, there was bunches out there. There was barracks full. At basic training, there was a whole area at Lackland Air Force Base. It must have been 25 or 30 barracks, and each barracks holds 300. I mean, right. 250, 300, whatever, you know, because you did have rooms. See, all these wimps have rooms now. You had a... a a okay. long uh, dormitory, just like being in Catholic school, no problem. <laughs> and so what branch of the service? I went in the Air Force. And it was it, it, then it was still the Army Air Force, wasn't no, it? No, it wasn't, but we didn't oh. have the new uniforms yet. Ah. So we were the Brown Shoe Air Force with those ugly, uh, khaki-looking dresses for fatigues. The button down the front. To this day, I will not wear a button down the front dress. <laughs> and, and what was the highest rank you achieved in the Air Force? First lieutenant. And how long were you in? Nine years. Oh, wow. So you made it a career. No. Sort of. <laughs> no, the thing, along toward the end there, the thing called RIF, Reduction in Force, and they said, well, you could always go back to being a tech sergeant. I said, you can't go back to being a tech sergeant after you've been an officer over the same people. This is not going to work, you know. I think so I said, right. I'll just go. I'll, I, I opted out. That sounds like a smart move. Um, do you recall what it was like your first days as a woman to go into the service? You, a huge sorority. There was nothing but girls there. And, you know, the dining room was women. When you went over to the hospital to get your shots, you went with women, you know. No big deal. Uh, tell me about your boot camp. Did you have to do the, the normal training? Absolutely. So you jumped the hurdles and... Yeah, you had to do all that. The uh, one thing they learned, though, is I could throw that forty-five and here hurt somebody better than shoot it. <laughs> they give you a forty-five, and the kickback is almost all the way up to the sky. So finally, they sh filed down the shear pin. They said I could manage that one. I told them I, I could throw this and hit somebody, but I'm not going to hit a thing firing it. So, wow. Um, do you remember any of your instructors? And were they men or women? They were women. Uh-oh. Her name was L-E-T-H-A, Letha. And when she wasn't listening, she was Lieutenant Lethal P. Willingham. <laughs> <laughs> Lethal P. Willingham, I will never forget, and I hope she sees this. <laughs> <laughs> so what did she do to you? Well, she was tough, but there's a difference between tough and sadis sadistic. Holy P. Playing baseball, footballs, softball, whatever we were out in the field there, Texas had great big cracks in the ground because of uh, no water. So I fell into one of the cracks running after a ball to see if I could field it, and I really hurt my ankle. It didn't break, but it, the sprain was really bad. So I go over to the hospital, and they take me there, and they taped me up at 100 20 degree Texas heat. Put that wide uh, tape, start yeah. on one side, bring it under the foot, and bring it up, Around. and then tape it this way. Okay. I don't have MD after my name, so. After about three or four days, it began to smell. <laughs> and after a week, I went to her and I said, 
there is something wrong here. This should have come off before now and maybe a different kind of bandage or something. She says, well, if you really feel you have to go over there, and it's on the other side of the base. There's a highway between the middle of Lackland Air Force Base. Huh. And we're on the other side, and I got to walk to the hospital. She even the score. She knew I, I didn't care for her. But she, she even the score. When they took it off, I had huge sores. It was the biggest mess. They find, they put me in the hospital because they were they didn't know what they had done, you know. And they, some people had to answer, "Why did you leave this tape on this person this long?" You know. So, walking to the hospital, I I did not call her any Christian socially acceptable names. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't. Oh. But you were determined. Is that what got you through it? All this? Oh yeah. Well, once you sign up, you don't unsign. You can't, you can't <laughs> do that, can you? It's just like the men, you're in, you're in, you know. So now, how long were you in basic training? 16 weeks. But actually, it could be 12 weeks if they wanted it to be. But it, uh, it's usually 16 weeks, give or take. But I would imagine it's different now because of the how they trade them, everybody, men and women together. It's... You can't even visualize the same thing now. It's okay. It's not bad. So when you were through with basic training, then where did you go? The kitchens, because I volunteered. <laughs> at the same base? Yeah. I was on the, uh, in the, at Lackland Air Force Base for a long time. And uh, same door uh, barracks with a lot of the same people. They went to other training, like weather and things like that. but. I like my kitchen, so that's where I went. Great. Uh, so you did not get involved in any combat because you really enlisted after the war was over. Well, <laughs> or there were some wars after World there, War II. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, one day uh, I made tech sergeant, and by then you could have your own room at the end of the barracks. The rest of it was just double bunk beds. That's redundant, but anyway, bunk beds all the way up and down the hall way, but uh, a tech sergeant got her, got her own room. I come home and there's a set of orders on my bed. I'm going to OCS. I said, oh, ho, 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 you know. And I went to see people. I said, why me? Well, I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I go to officer candidate school. And again, I volunteered for the kitchens. But in the Department of Defense, trying to consolidate the Department of the Defense, we, you went to an Army food service school at Fort Lee, Virginia. And we had two Greek officers, we had some Navy officers, we had a lot of Army officers, and we had me. <laughs> but that's all right. I got through the meat cutting and everything, all right, no problem. And after that, they didn't really have a place to put me right yet. I knew I was going to a SAC base, Strategic Air Command base, but all the shifting wasn't done yet because you had to move the officer ahead of me out so I could come in. So I'm not doing too much, and they said, well, you can't just sit around. So they said, there was, there's a big airplane, that there's a lot of them now, but those days it was called the XC-99. And it went between two air material areas, San, uh, San Antonio and then uh, uh, Sacramento out in California. So they said I had to go and take this clipboard and all this paperwork and go to Sacramento. Now, all I have on is the clothes I had on. <laughs> and I get off in Sacramento, they said, you're going over to Korea. I said, uh huh. No toothbrush or nothing? Well, we'll see that you get one. I said, okay. So we landed on Johnson Island. If you've never landed on Johnson Island, you should. <laughs> it's like landing on an aircraft carrier. That's about how big that island is. But you have to refuel. This is before jet airplanes. So from there, we go up to Seoul, Korea. And I'm to pick up 300 people didn't come home. And I'm the escort officer for these men to get them back to the United States. 
you have to make sure that you have the paperwork on the right coffin with the right serial number and the flag. And the flag has to be on the coffin correctly. And you have to make hope you're sending the right child home to the right parent. Mm. So we get all that paperwork done. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the airplane. I said, I am so dirty. I can't believe this, you know. They said, well, go ahead and wash up. And I went to step out of the airplane. They're shooting. I said, I'm not going anywhere. And they said, well, you have to because you have to get this paperwork signed by Colonel so-and-so. I said, Colonel so-and-so has on a flak jacket and a helmet. Colonel so-and-so can come out here. Well, this was not approved military <laughs> courtesy. Pretty soon he comes stomping out, and then when he saw it was a female person, he goes, why are you on this duty? I said, you're asking me? <laughs> I, said, I, just, I just go where they push me. So he signed all the paperwork and everything, but I wasn't getting in any shooting war for anybody. So pretty soon the airplane took off, and we went to Johnson Island again, then we went to Sac uh, Sacramento, then we went to, where was I? In Texas, San Antonio, and I got off the airplane and went in the showers. I bet. <laughs> it was fun, though. But I, I decided wars for the men. They want to go out there and shoot each other. That's... That's, that's their problem, not mine. You know, I'm not going to, I don't approve of the women out there shooting today, so whatever. Were you awarded any medals or uh, citations? I got or? a good conduct medal, which was, was a surprise. No, that's important. <laughs> so so we, we'd like to, uh, to know about that. Uh, what did you do to get the good conduct medal? Didn't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> A bunch of us slid around the beer a little bit and what have you, but for the most part, we're pretty straight girls. We just uh, walked the line, that's all. And everybody protected each other, you know. They say, here comes Sarge, you know. You put out the cigarettes or whatever, <laughs> you know. Everybody took care of everybody, so everybody got a good conduct medal unless you were really, unless you robbed a bank, then you had a problem. <laughs> Now, where was your family at this time, and how did you keep uh, track of them? And Just letters. And they were everywhere. I come from a huge family, so I just wrote to the parents. That's enough. They spread the word. <laughs> spread the word. Uh, now, since you were in the kitchen, I assume the food was good. Absolutely. That's I the first time we'll hear that statement, you know. Yeah. No, we, uh, well... When I got stationed in Greenland, at Christmas time, I made sure all the enlisted people had something. A lot of them didn't get anything from home, not even a Christmas card. I always made sure everybody had something. We had a Christmas party. We locked the mess hall so nobody else could come in. I bought beer for them. So it came time to open my present. I went, okay. And it was a t-shirt. And it said, bitch, 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 bitch. <laughs> And I wore it. I was hard to work for, but we had good mess halls. <laughs> uh, when did you go to Greenland, and how long were you there? Well, I was stationed at uh, uh, the Strategic Air Command Base, which doesn't exist anymore, called Lake Charles, Louisiana. And the food service officer in Sondrastrom, Greenland, got seriously ill, and it was like, 50 below or something like that. They couldn't get him out. When they finally got him out, he got as far as Newfoundland, and he passed away. He had some, maybe pneumonia or something, you know, something really bad, and they really needed a food service officer up there. So my colonel, actually the general called me, and he says, would you go? He says, you don't have to. I said, no, I'll go. It's an adventure. So I was the first woman stationed above the Arctic Circle Yay. in Greenland. That's it was exciting. a place called Sondrastrom. It's uh, just above the Arctic Circle. It's south of Thule. Thule was at the top of Greenland. Greenland shaped like an egg. And uh, everything was fine. And see, the social attitudes were entirely different then. I never had any problems. Never. I bowled on every team I could bowl on. They only had one bathroom. Of course, they didn't have any women up there. So I'd tell one of the sergeants, I can't the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. The lieutenant has to go to the bathroom. I said, you don't have to tell everybody, you know. 
So they'd go make sure the bathroom was empty, and then they'd stand outside the door and tell them they couldn't come in, you know, and I'm going, I don't, I don't know whether I like this or not. <laughs> Pretty soon two other girls came up there, they were in finance, and they didn't like it, they didn't stay too long. They thought that that was absolutely terrible, you know, and I went, well, <laughs> How long were you there? Well, you're only supposed to be there 10 months, and your records give you credit for 12. At the, this actually happened now. At the 18th month, I went into my colonel. I'm sure he's dead and gone now, so I can tell this story. My colonel was an alcoholic. <laughs> and we had, were in the old army-type bases, the H-shape base, where the officers lived on two the two legs of the age, and across the middle was the officer's dining room and bar. And I had to lock the bar. Every time I turned around, this colonel was in that bar. So I told him, I said, I, I've been here 18 months. He says, you couldn't have. I said, oh, please. So I called Washington, and this actually happened. At one time, I wished I'd had a recording. I said, I'm still up here in Greenland, and I'm supposed to be reassigned. Suppose we find somebody. And this officer, some big major or somebody, turns around and says, we don't have any women in Greenland. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> and I was actually not on the records for a while, I guess, because I thought when they, they shipped back the other two girls, maybe they did all the records, you know. So finally I got back, so that was okay. Now, when you got back, where did you get back to? Well, by then, in its infinite wisdom, another oxymoron, they military decided to, uh, uh, well, not cater, but uh, give all the mess halls to civilian businesses. Yeah. And if you were in whatever, Okobo, Oklahoma or somewhere, your local uh, person that had a restaurant made the bid that he could run the mess hall on the base, which fundamentally put me out of a job, so they sent me to personnel school at Scott Air Force Base. More people went through Scott Air Force Base. Ah. Oh. So, so you went there, and, yeah. and then were you in personnel after that? Yeah, I was uh, the adjutant down at uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. It's a training base for uh, radar and weather and things like that for the young people. So. And did you like being in Biloxi? Oh, yeah. I ended up as a treasurer for the Girl Scout Council. I didn't do too much on the base. I, I went around occasionally to sign paperwork. Other than that, I was in town. <laughs> Good for you. Now, did you keep a diary of any kind? Yeah, Mama had it. I don't know where it is. Well, that's not what the answer we want to hear. Eh, diaries are too personal. It's nobody else's business. I, would, I wouldn't have left it for somebody anyway, so it's okay. All right. Um, so where were you the day your service ended? Where, where were you stationed then? Uh, Biloxi. Oh, you were in Biloxi. Yeah. And what date would that have been? Pardon? What, what year would that have been? Uh, nine, well, just a, a little bit before 1960, because in 1960 I was trying to go back to college but didn't have any money. And you couldn't get the GI Bill like everybody else? Aha. Uh -huh. A very sore point. In those days, the GI Bill, regardless of rent or anything, gave you $119 a month, and that was it. And I wanted to be in physical education down at University of Miami. Daddy says, you're not going to make it. I said, I know, but let me try. So you take your six months, which would be one semester, of $119 and turned it over to the University of Miami and that didn't even make all of the tuition. I still had to have a hamburger and some books. So I went to work from midnight to seven at um, Pump Company. It starts with a W but it's not Walgreens, that's for sure. But anyway, this Pump Company and I worked on the uh, teletype and uh, the men would send the orders in and then I'd send them on further on the teletype ribbon, the thing that came out of the teletype like that, uh, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Then I got home by about 7 or 7.30 with one of my roommates. We rented a house together, four of us, and uh, 
my roommates would be sitting there in the car waiting for me, hand me my history book, and I'd go to class. Oh. This could only go on for a while, and after that, you're yeah, you're worn out. Why didn't you get the GI Bill? I did get it. All we got was $119 a month. Why didn't you get what the men were getting? That's what the men got. Well, we just interviewed someone who got his whole way through college and medical school on the GI Bill. And, I said, and he's my age? Older. Well, he had help somewhere. Or there was a special scholarship or something because when you uh, lined up at the bursar's desk to get your check, or in my case, sign it over to the university, all the men, every, everybody there, nurses, everybody was getting $119. And that just covered tuition? That was it. <laughs> but that did cover your tuition, and then you had to do the room and No, board. you still needed some more. The tuition in Miami in those days was nearly almost $1,000 a semester. Now it's 40000 <laughs> Amazing. So after you got uh, out of school, what did you do after that? Well, I was working a cocktail party. <laughs> And this, the people were from Jamaica, and they were looking for people to go to Jamaica to work. So I said, here, here. And I went to, to Jamaica and worked for quite some time. You, you went from the North Pole to Jamaica and back again. That's Jamaica was better. <laughs> <laughs> Warmer, certainly. Yep. <laughs> uh, now, did you, did you, these friends that you made in the service, did you continue those friendships after you got out? Some yes, some no. Uh, it it just it just filters away, just like people you played bridge with twenty years ago. You can't even remember their names, you know. So. Yeah. Um, did you join a veterans organization? I started to a couple of times, but I don't know. Well, of course, I didn't have much. You, I didn't have any money to join when I was in school, so you know. I just haven't bothered. Is my problem, <laughs> I guess. So, um, any other funny stories? You've got more funny stories than most of the people. I've got to give you credit for that. I think you uh, had more fun doing what you were doing. I did. I think you have fun wherever you are. I do. Yes. There's a twinkle in the eye that tells yes. me that. Are there any other stories you'd like to tell us? Well, when you're stationed at Scott Air Force Base, one of the regulations is, are you going to St. Louis? Yeah. So you get in your car or cars with other people and you lock your doors and roll up your windows and you get through East St. Louis as fast as you can. And you know why, don't you? Yeah. It was a mafia headquarters. <laughs> yeah. So that's all right. St. Louis was a lot of fun. We went to the opera there, full dress, everything. We had a, we had a good time. We really did. We saw a lot of things, you know. And uh, when we were... Uh, and Scott, um, we went to baseball. We went to Chicago Cubs baseball. Poor guys. They were as bad then as they are now. I think they lost like 18 to 2 or something. Oh, boy. But anyway, you just, you know, if the base had tickets to something, you went by and see if you could have any of them. And if you were an officer, you, you had to pay your share. If you were enlisted, they were free. We didn't, that doesn't make any difference. You understand that. And uh, we'd go on these big buses to different places. It was, it was fun. It really was. And did you ever have any of the entertainers come to the base? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm at Sonderstrom, and Bob Hope is supposed to be coming to Thule. And we were supposed to load up a plane to take to Thule. And... Some, some of the guys went ahead and went. Somehow or other, it turned out all of us couldn't go. It was probably the weather. But anyway, they came back, and Bob Hope never showed up. The show was there, but he wasn't. Everybody said, you know, I really object to that. You know, we loaded up to go see Bob Hope. And then uh, Arthur Godfrey, you probably don't remember Arthur. I do. Okay. Oh, yeah. He was supposed to come to Sontrastrom, and they set the show and Don Arthur Godfrey. So I said, well, that cuts that <laughs> out of my life. I never heard they did that. Well, they had the shows on the road all the time, but they didn't always have a named person with them. Like they had the dancers and the people that, you know, told stand-up comedians from 
East Podunk, Indiana or somewhere, you know. And they were okay. This is our, a magician. We always liked that. We would sit and boo the magician. <laughs> he would eventually get off stage. And let's see, I don't know, other than that. And we celebrated all the holidays. And if I could, if the base was small enough, I usually had a list of birthdays. Well, especially in my own squadron, I had birthdays. And uh, I had the best first sergeant, bless his rest his soul, what a man. Biggest, blackest African-American man you have ever seen. He could have played for the Detroit Lions. And his name was Sergeant Fulkerson. Well, he and I met each other at Lake Charles, Louisiana. And he came in the office one day, he says, I hope you're not like that major that just left. And I'm, excuse me, you know. He says, he didn't do anything, and I had to do all the work. Are you going to help? I went, yes, I, I will, you know. So we talked for a little bit, and I said, I really need to know who's who, and what's what, and where's where. He says, okay. He says, I think we ought to call all the troops together first and introduce you because they're not sure if you're here or not. I said, okay. So a couple of those smart alecks came by the office and, you know, came in and said, oh, you're real, or something like that. I went, excuse me? <laughs> so I said, I go, I'll go fix this. So we went downstairs, and of course, when the officer walks in, they say, they stand up for attention, see? And the officer is supposed to say, seats, and they could sit down. I didn't. <laughs> I said, none of you like to work for a woman. Tough tomatoes. Now, actually, that's not what I said. Tough tomatoes. He said, see these? This is not dandruff. I turned around and walked out. Sergeant Fulkerson was outside. He was doubled up laughing. He says, that does it. You're OK. <laughs> we went over to the NCO club, got a beer. <laughs> But you had to be that way. Yeah. Well, you established your... Yeah. I'm me, who are you? <laughs> you know? And I think the, one of the major mistakes the service always made in those days, they took in people that couldn't read and write. And I, I'm sure you don't believe this, but it's true. Do you ever look at MASH when he pays the troops? He pays money, doesn't he? Well, that's how we paid. And there were 32 names to a long sheet of paper. If that person could read, even write his name or print it with an X, or they call it X, and they were called X flights. I said, why would food service have X flights? How's he going to tell rat poison from instant potatoes? Excuse me? You know, I fought this the whole time I was in there. So as time went along and I got to know the troops, I went down one time. We had one young man from Louisiana, and he, his name was Henry. This child could cook anything, anytime, anywhere, and do what he was told to do, but he would disappear at the end of every month. <laughs> Sergeant Fulkerson says, we cannot keep court-martialing him. I said, I don't want to. Why is he going, where is he? He says, he goes home. I went, see, he goes home, he said, yeah. So I called Henry in and I said, sit down, I want to talk to you. Why do you go home at the end of every month? Because I have to take the money to my mother. I said, don't you send a money order or something? Well, I, I don't know what a money order is, and so I don't know, I know she doesn't know what a money order is. I said, okay, we'll help you. We've got to make a deal here, though. You're going to have to learn to read and write. I said, okay. So we worked it out so that the priest in the local parish down there, one of those bayous in Louisiana, would get the money. He'd have to sign for it. I made him accountable. And then he would make sure she got every penny of it. And we just sent him our best wishes. <laughs> he wasn't going to get a tip. So he did a good job. He really, really did. And Henry, and then I started going through the records, and um, Sergeant Fulkerson and I would pick Ted at a time. We started with A, B, C, D, E, F, yeah. C, Jane, Run. That actually happened. And pretty soon they could read at least the Hardy Boys or something like that. And they were a good bunch of kids. There's nothing wrong with them. They just couldn't read. 
So the next thing that happened was, I keep finding, they called me like 2 o'clock in the morning. It's bad enough I'm usually up at 2 o'clock, but they called me at 2 o'clock to go down to a bar called the Mary Go Round Bar in Slidell, Louisiana. <laughs> Had a dirt floor, one of the better class bars. We're picking up four or five of the men. I said, why are you always picking up food service? So I go down there in one of the big van-like trucks that they had, and I'd bring them all back to the barracks, tell them they couldn't get off the base for a while. I said, I'm cutting orders. You better not be off the base, and you're going to work double shifts. Oh, I said, well, too bad. Come to find out, the military police were angry because when they changed shifts at midnight, they didn't get their breakfast because that was actually supper for the shift going off, but it's breakfast for the shift coming on. I said, why didn't somebody say something? So then we started serving those little, the, the beef comes four ways, four-way box beef, stew, hamburger, uh, small steaks, what I can't remember. <laughs> it was four-way box beef, and we took the small steaks and made breakfast steaks and scrambled it, and of course down there you made grits and everything. All of a sudden, my troubles on the base seemed to end. The general, he was a pretty good guy, called me in and he says, what are you doing over there? <laughs> All your reports for the uh, police here, military police, are not um, coming in like they used to. I said, we're feeding the air police, but he goes, okay, that's all, Lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> he just shook his head and walked away. <laughs> but it, it, it was, it, it just had to get to know, you know. So, it was okay. But I, I got a letter from Henry. I kept it for years. It was the first letter he'd ever written. That's so, extraordinary. Yeah. He got, uh, this child could cook. He really could. He, um, we assigned him to the officers club for a while, and he was excellent. And then he got sent, uh, it was time to move on. And I think he was in Puerto Rico or someplace. Anyway, he um, wrote me a letter that he was in the officers club as the cook there, where he was on that base. And he was very pleased with himself, you know. There's a lot of good people in the service. I had a good time. I made a lot of good friends, you know. All be at our age now, they're just about all God. So. Well, it sounds like you also made, uh, you understand human nature, so you... No, I was raised with 14 brothers who would just beat the hell out of me. If we, How if many? The, 14, but they weren't all brothers. Some were cousins. Wow. See, there, we had a family, then my Aunt Elizabeth had asthma real bad. She was supposed to have children at all. She had all these children, and she died having the last baby, and Uncle Al, you probably, I don't know if you remember, remember when the uh, man hung on the side of the train and waved a lantern to tell the engineer right. to go for it? Well, that's what Uncle Al did, and one night he was working for the Florida East Coast Railroad. One night, it just was real rainy and everything, he slipped under the train, it killed him. So now we have all these children with no family, except we have family. So we went to Grandma Jessie's, <laughs> and everybody decided they'd come live with us because we had the biggest house on a farm. So Daddy made a sleeping porch on one side. They were all there. Nobody bothered me on this playground. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> and were they all older than you? Mm. Douglas was older, and um, AJ was older. Then I'm next, and then everybody else is younger than I am, but... They're all gone. Even um, huh. I, even the brothers, my only, uh, my sister Mary, but my sister cousin Shirley Ann, and them, they're all gone. So, boy, that happens. No they wonder just, you learned to just roll along with whatever was going on. What's going on now? No, I said you learned from them that you just roll along and go yeah. along and, and it works well, out. you know. <laughs> My sister had a tendency to not necessarily tell the truth and tattle. So some of the boys took her out behind the barn one night and threatened her life. <laughs> and that put an end to that. And I found out that works. 
Indeed it know. does. No, it did. It, um, they had just built a new mess hall in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And we had one sergeant that was uh, unreal. I told Sergeant Fulkerson, I said, short of shooting him, what are we going to do with him? He says, well, we can give him some bruises. And I said, yeah, we get caught, you and I go to jail. So he goes, no, no, you watch. So one time, somebody took him out behind the barracks and gave him a fisticuffs lesson. Not necessarily the Queensberry rules either. So he came storming in the office. And he was going to tell this and tell that. And I said, oh, my goodness gracious. Because we were on the second floor, it was a new building, and it had concrete steps going down. I said, I was there when you fell down those steps. And Sergeant Fulkerson and I picked you up, remember? Good show. What else are you going to do with him? You know, threaten me, I'll push him out the window. <laughs> <laughs> but he just, you know, you just had to, but they turned out to be okay. I didn't have any trouble with him. He just knew I wasn't going to put up with it, you know. You can't let one ruin all the rest of the barracks, you know, or, or you have one thief. You set him up, then you solve the problem. Yeah. You yeah. had a thief? Well, you're going to with that many people. You got people with the south side of Chicago there that that's, they don't have any money, they don't have any clothes, they don't have any shoes, so they go take what they need, you know. So they think they're going to do the same thing in the service. I said, if you need shoes, come here. We'll get you shoes, you know. Don't take somebody else's shoes. <laughs> Anything uh, else you want to add? No, this is I, fun. I, oh, the only thing that I always tell them, veterans, things over in their immediate school is I tell all the little girls that are sitting there, if you join the service, it's not the same as when I was in. And I don't approve of it now like it is. What do you mean? I said, well, the first place, we're the nurturers. We weren't made to carry an 80 pound bag, backpack with a AK-47 that weighs another 50 pounds and all the ammunition that goes with it. And then run up and down the sand in Afghanistan. Let the men do it. That's what they're built for. Well, why do you feel like this? I said, because in the first place, if they'd done it with me, I'd have turned around and said, well, where do I go to the bathroom? That's the first thing that caught my mind when I heard they were putting women in the, out in the military like that. Ridiculous. My son's captains of, as captain uh, submarines. He's got 26 years in the, military, the Navy, submarine service. He says there won't be 27 if they put women on the submarines. He says, I'll resign so fast they'll see my dust. There's some places we don't belong. We don't belong to be boxing. We don't belong to be playing football. Although I did break my nose once. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't belong to be, uh, actually, oh Lord, I hope we don't have any lady firemen here in Canton. But you know what? If I'm on the second floor and the thing is burning down, I want some nine-foot gorilla to come and lift me up by one arm and drag me down the ladder. I don't want somebody to go, put your foot here, now put your other foot there, you know. Excuse me? I want somebody who can help me, you know. Same thing with these accidents, right? They're good EMTs. I think women make excellent EMTs. We have some excellent women here. The, uh, Lieutenant Hull... Donald Hall's wife is a friend, and boy, is she good. Woo. You know, I don't know what the EMTs would do without her here. And that's where we belong. You know, there's a, there's a thousand jobs in the service. All these computers, the weather, the, the coding, the sonar, the, coding the, the women were the best at the coding, they found out. All the old movies you see where the ladies are pushing the things around uh, to show where the ships are, especially over in England, they called them wrens. They were the best at it. They could hear it and they, something about women, they would pick up the coordinates immediately and get the ship over here, and they, you know? So I don't know, I, I just think it's wrong. I think there's a lot of things women could do without being overtly 
masculine. And that now organization needs a trip to Sandstrom, Greenland, all of them. And I can't understand why. See, when, one time with the, uh, the bluefish was docked over at Gro uh, Groton, Sam says, you want to come have lunch with us? I said, sure. So you wear your slides. Because <laughs> the only way to get down yes. in that thing yes. is through the, whatever it's called, tunnel. So you go down this ladder, you go in, you go over the wardrobe, you have a lovely lunch, what have you. He said, you want to see a fire drill? I went, sure. Now, I'm backed up against the wall, just as flat as I could possibly be. And here's these kids run into whatever job they're assigned, right? Some put on this, some have this, I don't know, whatever they're doing. And of course, they're timed for this fire drill. And every time they went by and accidentally, oh, excuse me, sorry, you know. I'm I said, Sam, that's your point, isn't it? He says, it certainly is. We're guarantee we'll get one woman aboard that, oh, he touched me, you know. He says, you can't have this. How can you sleep when you're only 18 inches? Yeah. Bathrooms? They're going to have to redesign the submarine so they can have a bathroom. You say bathroom, what's the matter with you? I mean, you want to be on the submarine, you know. Because it, it's cost the aircraft carriers billions of dollars in overruns to make special uh, uh, places for the women to stay. And some of them are troublemakers. Women can be troublemakers. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they, there's a lot of eaves out there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, holding out that apple. <laughs> and you, you, the social thinking this day and time is completely foreign to me. Yeah. Because I can't, you know, when I talk to the children around here, what have you, it's it's an eye opener. And I, I, I think the military needs to reconsider how they use a massive amount of women personnel. It's great. I'm glad they're in there. You know, a lot of them, they're off the streets. Thank you, Lord. You know, but, uh, and the military has a tendency to make you think differently toward how you keep your clothes. To this day, I fold my towels a certain way, you know, and everything. You fold your towels like this. I don't know. <laughs> I fold them like this for so Don't bother me, you know. <laughs> but it just, uh, the military offers a lot. And they can use it for education. They can use it to mature. They can use it for um, social activities. There's a lot of social activities that are don't involve going out and get completely splashed every night, you know. And it's just, uh, there's a lot that can be done, but living in dormitories that are like motels are trouble. The universities have found that out already. Yeah. Sam went to Notre Dame, and he said he was glad he did, because Notre Dame finally had to put women there, or they wouldn't have gotten the federal help, you know. Well, they built a 27th floor dormitory, that's where the women are. They're not mixed in. At every one of these universities that have built dormitories like motels have had a problem. So I, I don't know, it just, um, it, it's, um, I just don't understand why the men don't take the country back and say this is the way it's supposed to be run, you know. <laughs> I'm just used to men saying, this is, how it's supposed to be. You go, oh, okay, I don't like that, but I'll change it later, you know. <laughs> That's how you get around them, you know. But you, you, you can't, um, these women do not belong out there in Afghanistan with a, a backpack and a female problems and an AK, you know, it's a wonder she doesn't turn, <laughs> she's having a real hard time, she doesn't turn around and shoot the sergeant. I mean, you know. Yeah. So I, I don't know, I just, uh, I, th I think the military needs to reevaluate how they use this massive amount of manpower because there's millions of women out there that would, I think they would probably be more useful in the service if they did women things. What they're supposed to. That might be sexist, but that's just too bad because that's how I feel. <laughs> well, listen, we thank you very much. This has thank been you. very enjoyable. Thank you. Don't you think? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.